Hello, today I'm going to be reviewing Fractal's latest high-end case, the Torrent, and I've already done a full step-by-step -step PC build guide in this case, and if you haven't seen that, you'll find a link to that video in the description. So when Fractal asked me to review the case and sent me the images of it, I was so excited, and I think you can see why, looking at the front end, it is absolutely stunning. I think that's a combination of the open Y-shaped front grille combined with the two 180mm fans at the front. And Fractal described this case as offering the highest possible airflow out of the box with no compromises in fitting the high-end hardware into the case. And I completely agree with that statement, having done the review, and I'll show you why in this review. The case is available in two different versions, both with and without RGB, and as you can see, I've got the version with the RGB. As you'd expect from Fractal, it's available in a whole variety of different colours and options. So the black version is available with a solid side panel, you've got a tempered glass panel with a light tint, which is the one I've got, and you can also get a tempered glass panel with a dark tint. The white version is available just with a clear tempered glass panel, while there is a grey version with a light tint on the tempered glass side panel. As far as I'm aware, it's only the black model that you can get in the RGB version. I don't currently have an MSRP yet on any of the models, but once I do, I'll include them in the video's description. Okay, let's take a closer look at the case. Both of the case's side panels are made from tempered glass with steel reinforced edges. They feature Fractal's toolless top latching mechanism, where the top of the panel just simply needs to be pulled forward to lift it away. To remove the front panel, all you need to do is simply pull it forward from the top and lift it away. Behind the front panel, we've got a full-length nylon dust filter, and with it removed, you can see the front panel is going to offer very little resistance to airflow. At the bottom of the case, we've got another full-length nylon dust filter, which can simply be pulled out from the front. With the front panel removed, we get a great look at Fractal's brand new 180mm Prisma AL18 PWM ARGB fans. If you have got the non-RGB version of the case, you'll get Dynamic X2GP fans, which are also 180mm. Taking a look at the front I.O., we've got a single USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-C connector, we've got two USB 3.0 Type-A connectors, we've got a power and reset button, and a separate headphone and microphone jack. The top panel is removed by loosening two thumb screws at the back, and then simply pulling the top backwards and lifting it away. With the top panel removed, we can see that the power supply is going to go at the top of the case, and this case will accommodate full-sized ATX power supplies up to a maximum length of 230mm. You can see we've got some Velcro straps in this compartment to help with cable management, and if you're thinking of doing a custom loop in the case, you'll be pleased to see there's some cutouts at the top for a fill port. On the power supply shroud in the main body of the case, we've got an ARGB lighting bar, and you will find this in all versions of the case, including the non-RGB versions, apart from the one with the solid side panel. Moving into the main body of the case, you will see this is quite a large case, and as you would expect, it will accommodate motherboards up to EATX. At the rear of the case, we've got seven horizontal PCI expansion slots, and although we've got no dedicated vertical slots, you can use Fractal's FlexB20 vertical riser bracket with this case. The maximum length for graphics card support is 461mm, are 423mm with the pre-installed front fans. It's nice to see in the case accessory box we've got a GPU support bracket, and you're going to mount this just over to the right hand side of the motherboard where there is some cutouts. And again, you can also use these cutouts to mount your reservoir if you want to go with a custom loop. So one of the big advantages of having the power supply at the top of the case is it leaves the bottom of the case free for fans, which should give some great GPU temperatures. The case comes with a further three case fans installed at the bottom, and there are the Prisma AL14 PWM ARGB fans. And again, if you've got the non-RGB version, you're going to have Dynamic X2 GP14 fans. The fans are installed on a removable bracket at the bottom. To remove it, all you need to do is loosen the two thumb screws, slide backwards, and lift it up and away. Taking a look at the case's fan support, so at the front you've got two 180mm fans pre-installed, 
Alternatively, you can remove these and fit either three 140mm or three 120mm fans. Again, at the bottom of the case, we've got three 140mm fans pre-installed, but if you prefer, you can fit two 180mm fans or up to three 120mm fans. At the rear of the case, there's no fan pre-installed, but you can fit either a 120mm or a 140mm fan there. With a maximum CPU cooler height of 188mm, you shouldn't have any problem fitting a large premium air cooler in this case. In terms of radiator support, you can fit up to a 420mm radiator both at the front and at the bottom, and up to a 140mm radiator at the rear. If you do want to install a radiator at the front, or go with either 120 or 140mm fans at the front, you're going to have to change the case's front layout. First thing to do is remove the 180mm fans. You then need to remove the 180mm fan brackets. There's one at the top and one at the bottom. And then you've got two brackets in the case's accessory box. You either need to fit your radiator or fans to this bracket, and then you can bring them into the front of the case and fix them to the front of the case with four screws. Moving into the rear compartment, it's good to see we've got plenty of cutouts in all the right places and they all have rubber grommets on them. As well as this, cable management should be straightforward with plenty of cable alignment clips, velcro straps and a cable routing space of 32mm. The case has four dedicated 2.5 inch drive mounting brackets over to the left hand side. They're each held on with a thumb screw. Once it's loosened, the brackets can simply be removed. Down at the bottom right hand side, we've got two dedicated 3.5 inch drive brackets. Again, they're each held on with a thumb screw. Once this has been loosened, the bracket can simply be removed. It's good to see the case comes with a built-in PWM fan hub, which will accommodate up to a maximum of nine fans with motherboard control. Although the case doesn't come with an ARGB hub, all the fans are daisy chainable, so you can power them all off a single ARGB header on your motherboard. Moving to the back of the case, and because your power supply is going to be at the top, the power supply cable is going to have to run down the back of the case, where it can actually look quite untidy. Fractal have thought about this, and there's four Velcro cable straps, which is going to keep your power supply cable nicely affixed to the back of the case and make everything look nice and tidy. At the bottom of the case, we've got two recessed channels where you can add optional light strips. So that's the case's main features. Let's take a look at the build I put together in it. So I think you'll agree the build looks absolutely stunning, but what about the thermals and the noise? So our i9-11900K idled at 32 degrees, reaching a maximum of 100 degrees during a 20 minute idle 64 stability test, with all components in the system being stressed. Our Strix 3080 idled at 34 degrees, while it reached a maximum temperature of 73 degrees during the IDA64 stability test. 
Taking a look at the noise levels, the idle noise levels were excellent at only 34 decibels, while during the 20 minute idle 64 stability test, the average noise levels were 55, which is probably in the moderate to high range. The next thing I want to do is look at a whole variety of different locations, moving the fans about, going to an air cooler to see what difference that makes to the temperatures. But before I do that, I think that we need to deal with the high CPU temperature because I know a lot of you will have picked up on 100 degrees is pretty high. Importantly, what I can say is it is not the case. There's a few different factors contributing to that and all will become clear later on in the video. What I want to do is start off comparing the different configurations and yes, the CPU temperature will be high during those, but all will become clear later on in the video. And what I can say is actually this case is excellent in terms of temperatures. So the first thing I wanted to look at was, was there any difference in terms of noise and temperatures if we converted the bottom of the case back to its default configuration? So replacing the two 180 millimeter fans with three 140 millimeter fans. So with the three 140 millimeter fans at the bottom, our CPU idled one degree cooler, while there was no difference to the CPU temperatures under load. Taking a look at the GPU temperatures, they were lower by two degrees, both at idle and under load, and there was no difference to the noise levels. I then went ahead and removed the case's rear fan and then reran this comparison. So with the three 140 millimeter fans at the bottom, our CPU was three degrees cooler, both at idle and under load. It was a similar story with the GPU being two degrees cooler at idle, and three degrees cooler under load with the 140 millimeter fans at the bottom. And again, there was no difference to the noise levels. So in terms of temperatures, it's fairly clear three 140 millimeter fans at the bottom is definitely better than two 180 millimeter fans. That doesn't tell the whole story though, because I think the 180 millimeter fans look absolutely stunning at the bottom and make this case look completely different. And if somebody was to walk into your room, they would look at it and go, wow. If you just had three 140 millimeter fans at the bottom, it doesn't really stand out for me. So I think you do have to weigh up the slight improvement in temperatures versus that Y factor when you look at it. Next thing I want to look at was did having a rear exhaust fan actually make any difference in terms of temperatures and noises? Because it seemed quite an unusual choice to me that Fractal shipped the cases with fans at the front and the bottom but not at the rear. So take a look first of all with 180 millimeter fans at the bottom, having a rear exhaust fan meant CPU temperatures came down by one degree both at idle and under load. Although there was no difference to the GPU idle temperatures, the rear exhaust fan brought the GPU load temperatures down by one degree. In terms of noise, the rear exhaust fan added two decibels to the idle noise but didn't make any difference under load. Taking a look at the same thing again, but this time with three 140 millimeter fans at the bottom. So this time CPU temperatures were actually higher with the rear exhaust fan by one degree at idle and two degrees under load. There was no difference to the GPU temperatures. And again, the rear exhaust fan was associated with two decibels of extra noise at idle. So this explains Fractal's decision to ship the case without a rear exhaust fan because adding one in, in its default configuration, with 140 millimeter fans at the bottom actually makes the noise levels and the temperatures worse. Even with the 180 millimeter fans at the bottom, you're only slaving very slightly in terms of temperatures. That is gonna be offset by an increase in noise levels. Plus you're gonna to have to spend money on a fan. So my advice to you would be to leave the rear fan location empty. Next thing I wanted to do was test how good the case was for air cooling. So I put the fans back to their default location, two 180 millimeter fans at the front, three 140 millimeter fans at the bottom, left the rear fan location empty and added Noctua's NHD 15 into the build. Taking a look at the temperatures, our CPU idled at 31 degrees, while under a 20 minute idle 64 stability test, the CPU reached a maximum of 111 degrees. Our GPU idled at 32 degrees and reached a maximum of 70 degrees during the IDA64 stability test. In terms of noise, we had an average of 32 decibels at idle and 54 decibels under load. So again, I know what you're thinking, that CPU load temperature is far too high and I completely agree with you. I'm gonna explain why. Again, it's not the case, 
but let's stick with the different configurations for now. So again, the first thing I want to look at, but this time in terms of air cooling, did it matter if you had three 140mm fans at the bottom or two 180mm fans? So at idle in terms of CPU and GPU temperatures, it didn't make any difference. While with the 140mm fans at the bottom, our CPU ran one degree hotter during the Ida64 stability test, but our GPU ran three degrees cooler. In terms of noise difference, the only thing that we noticed was that the 180mm fans were one decibel quieter at idle. So I think putting all that together, again, three 140mm fans at the bottom in terms of temperatures are the best way to go. But in terms of looks, I'm still a big fan of the 180mm fans at the bottom. Next thing to look at was did adding a rear exhaust fan in with an air cooler make any difference? And as we've already shown, the 140mm fans at the bottom give you the best temperatures. This was the only configuration I tested this with. So taking a look at the temperatures for both our CPU and our GPU, both at idle and under load, each of the temperatures came down by one degree by adding that rear exhaust fan in. Looking at the noise levels is exactly the same story when we had the AIO. The rear exhaust fan adds an extra two decibels of noise to the idle noise levels, but didn't make any difference under load. So with an air cooler, there maybe is more of an argument for adding a rear exhaust fan in, although the difference in temperatures was very small, and whether that's worth the extra cost to you, you'll have to decide. So now we come on to look at whether you should go with an air cooler or an AIO. And taking a look at the idle temperatures, there's not actually that much of a difference. Under load, it's a completely different story, where with an air cooler, our CPU ran 12 degrees hotter. As you'd expect, having your AIO as a front intake, it's going to dump more hot air into the case, and GPU temperatures will go up. Although they only went up by an extra 2 degrees with the AIO compared to the air cooler. In terms of noise levels, there wasn't really that significant a difference between the two of them. So putting all that together, particularly if you have a difficult CPU to cool like we do in this build, you're much better going with an AIO. If you're going with an easier CPU to cool, you'd be perfectly fine with an air cooler. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put a summary slide up of all the configurations I've tested so far. So if you want to take a closer look at that, you can go ahead and pause your video. So now we need to try and get to the bottom of these high CPU temperatures. And I was incredibly surprised by these because looking at this case, it should give us incredible temperatures. Now, the first thing you may have noticed when the slides, when we were going through, it quoted ambient temperature at 25 degrees. And at the time I was doing the thermal testing, we were having a heat wave in Northern Ireland. It was about 30 degrees outside and 25 degrees inside. Normally when I do my thermal testing, it's about 20 degrees inside. At the time of recording this, we're now one week on and temperatures have fallen back down again. So the temperature in my studio today was 20 degrees. So I decided I would try and run the tests again in the last configuration, which was the NHD 15 and the fans in their default configuration. So taking a look at our thermals with ambient temperature decreased to 20 degrees, our CPU idled three degrees cooler, while under the Ida64 stability test, it was seven degrees cooler. GPU temperatures also came down by one degree at idle and three degrees during the Ida64 stability test. So the high ambient temperatures definitely did affect my original test results, but they weren't the whole story because the CPU was still running much hotter than I would expect it to. So I was gonna to have to take a closer look at the case, even though I wasn't convinced the case was contributing to it. So the next thing I did was I removed the front panel, front dust filter and bottom dust filter and reran the tests again. I sometimes will do this when I'm running my thermal tests, but when I looked at the front panel and dust filters in this case, I wasn't convinced they would make any difference in removing them. And taking a look at the results, I was completely right. Our CPU actually ran one degree hotter with the front panel and dust filters removed, while there was no difference to our GPU temperatures. And this is obviously within the margin of error, and it shows that the front panel and dust filters in this case are so good that removing them doesn't make any difference. So this has given us a bit more information about our case and the fact that the front panel and dust filters are so unrestrictive, they don't make any difference to the temperatures. And this is what I would have expected. But it doesn't answer our question about why are the CPU temperatures so high. So whenever I had done this build, I had updated the bias to the latest version, and I wondered could that have affected the temperatures. 
So I went back in and reinstalled an earlier version of the BIOS and ran the tests again. But this didn't actually make any difference and our CPU temperature only came down by one degree and there was no difference to the GPU temperatures. Okay, so still not convinced it was the case, but could it be the fans? So that was the next thing I was gonna have to test. So I removed the installed case fans and replaced them with Noctua 120 millimeter fans, which are optimized for airflow. So we had three 120 millimeter fans at the front and three 120 millimeter fans at the bottom and then re-ran the tests again. So taking a look at the temperatures and I only tested this under load conditions, our CPU was actually one degree hotter with the Noctua fans while our GPU was two degrees cooler. Where we did notice a significant difference was under the noise levels and during the IDA64 stability test, our PC was six decibels quieter with the Noctua fans. Because of the observed difference under load, I also went ahead and tested the noise levels at idle where the Noctua fans were two decibels quieter. So in doing these additional tests, I was definitely learning more about the case, but I still hadn't got to the bottom of the high CPU temperatures. I had basically ruled out everything about the case. Everything seemed good in terms of airflow. So the only thing left was the CPU. So I decided to change the CPU out for Intel's i9-10850K, which I have used in a number of builds, so fortunately I do have some data to compare to. And then I went ahead and reran the tests again. So taking a look at the temperatures, at this stage I still had all the Noctua fans in the build. Our CPU temperature under load came down by 22 degrees, with no difference to the GPU temperatures. I then went ahead and removed the Noctua fans, going back to two 180mm fans at the front and two 180mm fans at the bottom. This brought our CPU temperatures under load down by a further 2 degrees to a very acceptable 80 degrees, although our GPU temperatures did go up by 3 degrees to 71. Although this is probably more related to the two 180mm fans at the bottom, which we know don't perform as well as three 140mm fans. So how did this maximum CPU temperature of 80 degrees compare to the three other builds I've done using the i9-10850K? So I've done builds in the Antec Dark Cube, the Antec P120 Crystal, and also the Meshify 2 Compact. Now obviously we can't do a like-by-like -like comparison because a lot of the other components were different. So taking a look at the temperatures in each of the three builds using Noctua's NHD15, they were 86, 91, and 88. So in this case, with a temperature of 80, it is clearly the winner. It was only in the P120 Crystal that I used the same GPU. So summing up our thermal testing, our initial high CPU temperatures were due to a combination of high ambient temperature and a CPU that runs incredibly, incredibly hot. Switching it over to a CPU that just runs incredibly hot, our temperatures were actually very acceptable and the best I've recorded with the CPU which tells us the airflow in this case is excellent. Noise levels at ambient are excellent. Noise levels under load are a little high for my liking. But now that we know the airflow in this case is so good, it's a simple matter of going into the bias, modifying the fan curves so they don't spin up so high, and actually you'll have a build that runs cool and quiet. So now we come on to the things I liked about the case and I've already gone through all the case features so I'm not going to repeat all that again but I think the main things I liked about the case were the look of the case. I think it looks incredible and a large part of that is due to the front grille and the 180mm fans and my favourite configuration was two 180mm fans at the front and two at the bottom and I know that's not the best in terms of airflow but in terms of looks, it was incredible. The other thing I really like about the case, as I've come to expect from Fractal, is the build quality. It's exceptional. All the case layout and features are really good as well. Moving on to some of the things I didn't like, and again, these are all pretty small compared to the things that I did actually like. So Fractal have gone with a daisy chaining method for linking the fans together at the back of the case. The downside to that is it is really easy for the two ARGB connectors to come apart, particularly when you're using Velcro straps to hold the cables together. And when I originally put the build together, I had fastened the back panel up and recorded the final footage of the PC. 
only to realise that the RGB lighting bar at the front wasn't lighting up anymore. Opened the back of the case and it had come loose. So this is a very common problem when daisy chaining ARGB connectors. It's not unique to this case or these particular fans. Cooler Master have a great solution for this. They have a little plastic clip which goes over the two connectors and holds them together so they can't come apart. And it would have been nice if Fractal could add something like this into the build so your cables aren't going to come apart at the back when you've done your cable management. In the absence of this, I think just as you're doing your cable management at the back, once you've connected everything together, have a final check before you close the back panel. Another slight issue I had with the fan cables was when I was doing my original build, I moved one of the 140mm fans at the bottom up to the rear of the case. Unfortunately, the cable wasn't long enough to stretch to the fan hub down at the bottom of the case, and I needed to plug it directly into the motherboard. It's hard to blame Fractal because they don't come with a pre-installed fan at the rear and you can plug it straight into your motherboard but an extension cable might have been an option to include. Sticking with the fans and another thing I maybe wasn't so keen on was depending on the angle you looked at the fans in the main body of the case it was possible to see the individual LEDs. And I think this is largely due to how the fans are orientated. The outside of the fans, both at the bottom and at the front, is facing the outside of the case. So when you look into the main body of the case, you're looking at the back of each of the fans. And don't get me wrong, the fans are absolutely stunning, and this is only a very small feature. I thought I should point it out for completeness. This brings us on to if I was building in this case again, would I do anything differently? And normally when you do a build in a case, you learn quite a bit about it, and if you were doing things again, you might do things in a different order to avoid any problems. What I can say was building in this case was incredibly easy. And the only issues I had was moving the fans at the front to the bottom. And if you were going to build leaving the fans in the original configuration, you shouldn't run into any issues. The main issues I had was that once you have installed a radiator at the front, you can't actually get the bottom fan bracket back in and you have to loosen the radiator up to get the bracket in. So what I would recommend doing is installing the bottom fans on the bracket first before mounting a radiator at the front. The other issue I had was I tried to install the 180mm fans at the bottom and once I had sorted out the first issue I was trying to put the radiator back in and it wouldn't actually fit. And that's because I had centered the 180mm fans at the bottom. So if you are going with two 180mm fans at the bottom and a radiator at the front, you need to offset the fans towards the back of the case so your radiator at the front is going to fit. But apart from those two issues, building in this case was really straightforward. So now I've reached the stage in the review where I need to tell you, should you go out and get this case? And it's difficult to do that because I don't have the MSRP but I don't imagine this is going to be a cheap case. Given the premium materials, its large size and the number of high quality RGB fans included, I expect it to have a premium price to match its premium build quality. But even not knowing that price, I absolutely love this case and can definitely recommend it. The temperatures, once we got the issue sorted with the thermal testing, were exceptional, so it has incredibly good airflow, and I think it looks absolutely stunning. So even in the absence of knowing how much it costs, I think this is an incredibly good case, and I would be very happy with it sitting on my desk. So hopefully you find the review useful. If you have, please remember to give it a thumbs up, and if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. Thanks for watching.